good afternoon and welcome to Your DIY Health here on the Spreaker Radio Network. I'm your host, Sergeant Jim Ram, retired. You can call me Sarge. It's Thursday, October 13th, 2022. And uh, I won't talk about what we, what we normally talk about here because Thursdays we always talk about history. And uh, we've got uh, Mike Gaddy and Cal Robbins and DW with us. And they're going to be talking about some really cool stuff that we've just been discussing is really off the wall. But uh, before we do that, I just invite everybody to check the website, yourdiyhealth.com. That's Y-O-U-R-D-I-Y, like do-it-yourself, health, H-E-A-L-T-H, yourdiyhealth.com. Everything we normally talk about on the rest of the week is there, including all the products, the iTeraCare device, which is prominently featured at the top of the homepage, and uh, there's links and videos and all kinds of stuff, including a link to the, the actual sales site where you can purchase one, which we encourage you to do. Uh, you will be very, very happy with it, I'm sure. But uh, check all that stuff out, and keep in mind that uh, nothing we say in this show should be construed as an attempt to diagnose, treat, or cure any kind of a health or wealth issue. It's all here for your education and entertainment purposes only, so that as a responsible adult, you can use this show as a jumping-off point to do your own research and due diligence to make sure that what you're doing and what you're trying is right for you. And that being said, we're going to go right to the meat of the show today, and uh, we got Mike and Cal and DW. Let her rip, guys. DW, you first. You gotta unmute. Okay, so yeah, so I uh, I opened my big mouth in the pre-show, and now you yes, you did, it. you did okay. it big time, and that was good. So just let her rip. Just I, repeat I, what you said. I I stuck my foot in it. Well, I uh, I had the opportunity here over the last uh, four or five days to, in a grand total, spend about thirty hours in a car driving with with my own thoughts, which is a dangerous thing. <laughs> And, uh, I was, I was trying to, uh, try to synthesize. How do I, how do I articulate where we're at? And, uh, of course you have to understand something. I, I always work off the premise that I've got something wrong, wrong, uh, in order to answer questions or solve problems. Uh, because if you always had everything right, you wouldn't have any problems, would you? Right. You know, you probably never thought about that before. Right. Why do I have problems? Well, I had something wrong. And so in order to solve problems, you have to go, well, what do I have wrong? And I always have something wrong. And and so that's what I've done for the last 20 years is uh, challenge myself all the time on what am I missing? What have I got wrong? What do I misunderstand? Where are my perceptions uh, inaccurate? Where are my holes? Uh, what's the contradiction? And here we are, and uh, we're at this point uh, in this world uh, where we're repeating all the past mistakes of the last 300 years generationally, and people are walking in circles. They're like children going around with Hansel and Gretel, and they've walked in the woods now for two days, and Hansel looks at Gretel and he goes, gee, weren't we here before? Right. That, so that's where we're at. So uh, as I was riding along in my car thinking about this, so I go, well, what's this? What we have is uh, a bunch of politically played peoples. Uh, and and uh, for everybody that's here or everybody that listens to it later on, uh, on the rebroadcast, the radio show, wherever it comes at, I'm just going to make some declarative statements to you here. You've been politically played your entire life. What makes now any different? You wouldn't be in the place that you're in right now, psychologically, emotionally, or financially, if you'd had it right. Okay. So what makes now any different? Oh, you're, you're going you're gonna to spend your whole lifetime uh, trying to make logical conclusions out of false perceptions, and that's going to work for you. So what makes now any different? So I got some questions. So if you've got it right now, when you when before it was wrong, but you got it right now, tell me what's changed in your perceptions. Okay, what have you changed in your perceptions? What have you changed in your reading? Do you even read? Uh, what's changed in your studies? Or do you let somebody else do that for you? Uh, have you changed your counsel? Have you changed in your worldview of history? What have you changed in? In your behavior 
Have you ever asked yourself, you personally, go look in the mirror right now. What did you have wrong? Were you in belief systems? And if you can't ask yourself that question, if you can't admit to that you had it wrong, you're doomed. And you're part of the problem. All the while, you were supposedly opposing the communist revolution because that's what everybody told you you were doing. You were being assimilated, infiltrated, permeated with the social doctrines. And you spent your entire life in a socialist society. And now you're just seeing the, the penultimate uh, manifestations of its transition. Let me give you an example here. Let me give you a little example here. You want to you wanna see what's going on here, boys and girls? Here's the deal. Socialism is a transition from democracy to dictatorship. Socialism was created with the Constitution. Uh, the next phase was in the Civil War. That, that is the next phase of socialism. It was created by socialists, so it must have been socialism. Socialism had to overthrow monarchy and religion. Did you notice there's not a lot of monarchs around anymore? Did you notice there's not a lot of religion anymore? Okay, so they were overthrown. That's step one. When was it overthrown? Well, it was overthrown in the Constitution. That was the period of enlightenment, capitalism, Adam Smith, Republican and liberal democracy, stage one. Dispute, dispute that the enlightened federalists overthrew. That's This is what the Revolutionary War is for. They want to get to their enlightenment. Well, what's the enlightenment? Well, this is the Republican liberal democracy, Adam Smith. That's a step one. Bye-bye, King George. Now we have something we like to call capital, federal, and mercantilism. Okay. Yeah, well, this is step one. But guess what step one leads into? It leads into socialism. And socialism comes in two different flavors. It comes in a, a scientific socialism, classless, equality, liberty, fraternity. Uh, and it's done slowly as it was done here. Communism comes in, which is socialism, but it comes in by revolution. So I got to ask you, and I've been going on here a while, but I've been on a rant. I'm kind of fed up. You're going to have to you're going to have to start admitting you had something wrong and doing things different because you got a freight train coming at you and it's going to roll right over the top of you. And Tucker Carlson ain't going to help you. So, uh, you know, we're we're we're, we're in a <laughs> we're, we're in that push comes to shove moment. And uh so all these guys, I was I was kind of running on earlier about this, and these guys have now shoved me up and put me up to do this. All right, so there you go. I've I've got that off my chest. So oh well, yeah, one other thing. Most of your pastors are socialists, and this is this is why you can't find any remedy with them, because they believe in the social gospel. So you're going to have to you're going to have to embody those principles yourself and maybe lead them. So, Cal, your turn. Thanks, guys. <laughs> oh, that was the crowd loved that it. Was <laughs> that was excellent. DW. Did I no, did you, I lose everybody? <laughs> yeah, right. No, we actually gained a bunch of people. You might have wow. to repeat some of it. <laughs> well, if you do that again. We'll get more. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, hey, Jim. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, John here. Yeah, John. I just wanted to interject for a minute. I missed Daryl's rant, and I'm sorry I did, but. Uh, Catch you on the replay. Listen, I got some uh, interesting news from uh, the stockists uh, regarding the wands. Mm -hmm. Prices are going up. I mm. sent out a uh, question yesterday. I said, uh, there's buzz prices are going up. Any truth to this? If any, is there some idea what they will be? So for one stock, this guy wrote me back and says, there is truth to this, but we are waiting on the official notice from price. 
they should be making an official announcement in the network back office by the 15th or maybe sooner. Ooh. We've heard that any change won't go into effect until maybe November 1st, so we'll have a couple of weeks at least to take advantage of the lower prices before then. Ooh, get them now. Another stock has built. Another stock has uh, wrote back and said, yes, but nothing has been formally decided. Somebody spoke before they were supposed to. The <laughs> corporate came to the stock at first, and then they were going to speak with the leaders, and then they were going to make a formal announcement. So I really can't say anything because it was just discussion, and corporate had to go back. And after discussing with leaders, then they were going to make their final decision and make the announcement. So I think it's pretty clear that the prices are going to go up. So if anybody's on the fence, they need to grab it now. Hey. Cool. Appreciate it. That's all I had. Thanks, John. All right. Hey. So, Mike, you want to take it away, or Cal is, oh, Cal? is it your turn now? <laughs> it's Cal's turn. Well, Cal was Cal was Cal, Cal was gonna uh, bring bring to bear here. Uh, let, let me give you a little introduction, Cal. Cal was gonna bring to bear why why the why the comp Constitution doesn't have any limits on its powers, oh, yeah. and, and did, did I get that close, Cal? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> this this comes from last last Thursday. Mike got into a discussion with the Tenth Amendment Center, and he was sharing the conversation, and they were trying to describe that necessary means ne what necessary means, I guess, and it all hinges down on to whether this Constitution is a document of expressly delegated powers or is it a document of implied powers well uh, for some reason there's a bunch of people out there saying it's expressly delegated powers well all those people out there saying that weren't at the convention weren't part of the convention but here's a guy who was his name was oh yeah he's father of the constitution chief architect of the constitution one of the leading federalists none other than james madison himself and these are james madison's words about the constitution and, he, and this was during the debates over what became the 10th amendment he was replying to a proposal from mr thomas tudor tucker of south carolina who who had made a motion to include the word expressly so that the Constitution or the Tenth Amendment would eventually read powers not expressly delegated to this Constitution. Well, Mr. Madison of Virginia objected to this amendment, saying because it was impossible to confine a government to the exercise of express powers. There must necessarily be admitted powers by implication unless the Constitution descend to recount every minutia. He remembered that the word expressly had been moved in the convention of Virginia by the opponents of the ratification and after a full and fair discussion was given up by them and the system was allowed to retain its present form. In other words, they tried to, at the Virginia convention, say this was the intent, this is you know, the intent of the state, they wanted it to say expressly, but after arguing over it, they knew they couldn't win that argument, so they moved on. And so it, the Constitution went on to have implied powers. This is from James Madison. So all you constitutional experts out there, you are in disagreement with the architect and father of the Constitution, James Madison himself. This document is a document of implied powers. Now, we can go back to DW. DW, implied powers. What else can that mean? <laughs> wow. It's funny you should ask that. Uh, so if, if I was to imply what, impl what the implications are, <laughs> I would say that uh, uh, just looking at a list of synonyms will give you some, uh, s some very interesting possibilities here. So it, it, it might mean... A suggestion it might mean an inference they could infer that they need to do something uh, it could be a innuendo it could be a imputation uh, it really depends upon who gets to arbitrate what the implications are so the implication isn't isn't really so so much of a problem it's the one that arbitrates that implication and the government 
the government, uh, the federal government, those those legislators, the su su Supremes, uh, they get to interpret what the implications or what the implied powers are as necessary. And uh, so they get to they get to exercise their implied powers off the problems they create. Now, there's nothing could go wrong with that, is there? Isn't that just the most wonderful feedback loop ever? Oh, don't, yeah. don't, don't forget that they also have this, you know, that is, that is the supreme law. Who, who They become the sovereign, <laughs> so to speak. And so who is above them to say anything different? <laughs> well, not God. Well, uh, no, so I, they have what, what the federal constitution... <laughs> What the federal constitution does, here's your feedback loop. If you, uh, um, this is this is like turbocharging a car. This is what this is why this is why how feedback loops work. I have the implied powers. I can exercise the implied powers for whatever I need to solve the problems I created. What could go wrong? Or problems you just perceive or make up. That you don't even have to create a problem. You can just say, well, there's this apparent problem over here where there really isn't one and still apply that necessary and proper implied power to address it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so then you could tell people to take a vaccine that an injection they didn't need. Exactly. Okay. So Mike, you were gonna say something. Mike Mike, you, you were saying something, buddy. Well, uh, very uh adroitly there can you hear me yeah yep, go ahead. okay well very adroitly the old wig mentioned this early on he said with the necessary and proper clause we look at it and we go okay well whatever is necessary but the old wig says who gets to decide what is necessary it's never the people so if the people don't jump to Alexander Hamilton, 1792, in the proposal for the first U.S. bank, in a huge argument with Thomas Jefferson, because Jefferson says that the bank is not necessary, it's not constitutional, and in his many, like any other lawyer, he writes so much about it in contradiction to what he writes a complete word salad to Jefferson and to Washington, and it, in essence, he boils it down to necessary means whatever the government decides it means. And he said, obviously, uh, Mr. Jefferson, you did not read between the lines of necessary and proper. Reading between the lines of necessary and proper, you will find the reason for the U.S. bank. Now, Jefferson very adroitly responds with, well, I have looked between the lines and there ain't nothing there. But you still got the bank and you got the bank by the necessary and proper clause. Patrick Henry says the necessary and proper, the commerce and the general welfare clauses will be the windows through which all manners of evil shall pass. Now, the point that, that I'm, I'm just fed up with the majority of Americans who want to continue to believe that this, uh, that, oh, oh the, the government can't do that. You know, like the Tenth Amendment Center sent me a very nice email and said, we always listen to the words of James Madison, and we never listen to the words of an arrogant guy like you. <laughs> so, okay, well, that's all right. But obviously, obviously, they don't listen to the words of their own guy. Because it, no matter how many times, and, and uh, you know, Cal, you touched on it very well, directly from the first Congress, no government can be held to its strictly expressed delegated powers. It must have the powers of implication, which means no government can be told that Government is not limited by anything, and yet these people prance around and write articles called uh, uh, necessary means necessary. Well, no, necessary means whatever the hell the government says it means. And it, it's just absolutely amazing to me that, you know, and I'm, I'm with you, DW and Cal, 
I think the time has uh, has passed us by to where we can listen to these idiots telling us the government can't do what it's been doing every day for 234 years. And not only that, but they cool. love to charge they love to charge love to charge you money to tell you that the government can't do what it's been doing for 234 years. Well, people love to pay them to tell them that. <laughs> oh, yes. They love to pay for all you, got, all you All you got to do, because it makes them comfortable. Oh. So all you have to do, all you have to do is to put at the end of your name, oh, I am a constitutional attorney, or I am the Tenth Amendment Center, or I am David Barton, and I'm telling you what God said. Of course, he doesn't tell them which God he's talking about. Yeah. Well, I uh, I would I would suggest that uh, the majority majority of people uh, in this country, anyway, left, left or right, um, they they lost their conscience to empire, and uh, now that now that they've gone down that road, uh, they can't repent. I, I I'm sorry. I'm a broken record here. Until you can say you had something wrong, you, you're wasting your time. You you have to say you had something wrong. You actually have to say it out loud. You actually have to do it. It's actually it's an act of repentance. You you really should learn. You should, you should really forgive yourself, and then and then do something different, because. You're just digging the hole deeper. You're 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 killing yourself. You're killing your children. You're killing your grandchildren because you think you got something right, and you've ignored the contradictions. Right now, there is help, but you, you you're not going to find it by listening to the same people tell you the same stuff that they get paid for, get paid to say by the people that are playing you. Remember, you've been politically played your whole lives. You just you you just want to keep playing that game. Is that what you want to do? You think you're going to get something different? You just you're just going to let the clock run out. So, uh, so until you can admit, and to, uh, first maybe you have to comprehend, but until you can admit, you have a fake left and a fake right. You, you actually have to say that because all the evidence is there, uh, and 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 the capitalists. The capitalists, okay, the mercantilists, from the very beginning, have funded their own opposition. This is what makes it work. This was done all through the 1800s. Uh, the, there's, there's, there's nothing, there's nothing new. There's no, nothing new going on here. They're just leveraged it to a much higher level. It's much more sophisticated. And uh, I don't. I don't think there's much wiggle room now, uh, left guys. For uh, I, I don't know where you're going to move. I, I don't. I don't know what the, that new job is that you're going to get. Uh, I, I don't know who that new leader is. Uh, you know, Donald Trump's going to ride in and and save the day, right? So uh, Donald Trump is is part of the fake right. OK, and if if you can't if you can't contend with that, if you can't really cope with that, then, uh, well, you're absolutely wasting your time listening to me. Because uh, I won't give you any quarter on it. Uh, he's 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 a stone cold uh, capitalist. OK, and, and and capitalism is the basis is the basis of this capitalism is the basis of it capitalism overthrows monarchy not for you capitalism overthrows monarchy for itself and you ain't in it you're a tool you always have been and you're so much a tool that you promote to your children 
that they should go to schools, not education, schools to be schooled on how to be an employee. And an employee, a tool. Employee is a tool. Okay, so I have to draw out the contradictions here in the, in the, in the BS uh, ideology of this thing called Americanism. So I got I got I got this really, really good question here. I think it's a good question. It says that, and, and and you know we're not even we're 25 minutes into this. I'm looking forward to the last you know the next hour, so people could take shots at me here. And so, uh, my question is, how will your mythology become a reality, David Barton, Chris Van H Van Hall, Donald Trump, all the rest of you clowns, uh, you. Uh, tell me how your mythology is going to actually become a reality uh, when you when you have uh, a federal usury of capital. Okay, that I means just start right there. It's 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 a major plank in in the Communist Manifesto. It has to, it's been there since 1913. Okay, I mean, how do you? You can't you can't go anywhere from you can't re resolve anything under that capitalist control. And so you're just all moving deck chairs around. So I'm going to grab something here. I'm going to get something there. There's there's nothing in the future. There's no future. Until that's addressed. But all your investments are in it, aren't they? You've invested in it. I want my bonds. So if you're holding bonds, you're a user. If you're invested, you've invested your personal money into your 401k uh, and all these other investment vehicles, then you're a user. Well, you're part of the problem. That's really harsh. But like I said, time's up. You know, uh, you can't have it both ways. And that's that's been the beauty of the American psyche uh, that's been uh, leveraged uh, since uh, definitely since World War Two. You can have it both ways. You can march around the world killing, dominating wars of aggression and then look in the mirror and have the government and its propaganda machines and preachers tell you, uh, what, what an exceptional and indispensable people you are and you just lap it up and then go watch football. Okay. And, uh, I just can't seem to keep my mouth shut this morning, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Uh, help me out here. Uh, so says the guy mm -hmm. who called me about an hour ago and said, I'm going to sit on the sidelines today. <laughs> Right. <laughs> Until you wind him up, put me in coach. I'm ready to play today. <laughs> wow. So all we, had, all we had to do was wind him up in the pre uh, pre show. No, it's I, I think it's just that there's a general sense of frustration, especially if you're aware of the truth. And I think it's just gonna magnify itself all the way up through the election season. I think these that energy of an election season you can almost feel the palpitation of evil flowing around you if if you're aware of it. But you can't be aware of it if you're immersed of it. It's like trying to explain a, to a fish what water is. You know, it, it's just immersed in it. And so for the people that are totally immersed in this, they're not going to see it. These words are going to be word salad to them. <laughs> They don't right. want to, Cal. They don't want to. They, you know, they want to be comfortable. That's why they would uh, prefer to uh, be looking to see what's on TV, or maybe let's see who's playing Thursday night football. Or wow, my team, my college team plays on Saturday. Constitution, the world's going to hell. Who gives a damn? There's a game on. Yeah. It's, yeah. In the meantime, reality is going to come up and bitch slap them upside the head when it, their mythology is just going to, and they're not going to know what happened or they're not going to care. 
I mean, DW said there's no future. There's a future, and that future is called slavery. <laughs> well, to the, uh, to the well, common yeah. people. You know, I mean, well, that's Cal not the future you or I want, but that's the future that we're headed towards. Well, guys, with all due respect, we have been slaves since the Constitution was ratified by New Hampshire in June, of which gave them the nine states. Because Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1 gives them the, uh, the authority to tax you to take your property at any time they want to, for any reason they want to, in any amount they want to. I don't give a damn what you say past that. No one can tell me they accept that and they're not a slave. Well, that, that falls under eminent domain, dominion. Mm, the wonderful <laughs> Article 5. The wonderful, wonderful Article Emin 5, which says yeah. that the government can take anything they want of yours as long as they compensate you fairly. But who gets to decide what the compensation is and who sits in judgment of that? So they can take anything you want to. And that, uh, you know, earlier uh, I started about three o'clock this morning, guys. I really was getting into uh, what happened, uh, you know, once the civil law got started, what was happening in the border states. And I, I really want to do a Whistling Dixie on that, and I'm going to. But I was looking specifically at Missouri. And I looked at what was ordered, and when I read through that, I said, that's exactly what they're proposing now with this social credit score. Missouri did it January the 1st, 1862. Okay, number one, you have to pay a loyalty bond. And if you have ever said anything negative against the government, your property belongs to the government. They can seize it at their whim. And you, you in essence, if you have said, I don't trust the government, I think the government may be wrong, then you have lost all of your rights that you allege that you have. And the government can either incarcerate you or kill you without any form of due process. And that's exactly what's coming with this social credit score. If you have said anything, we're all in trouble here, guys. If you've said anything against the government or Good. exposed the government lies, you're in trouble. Well, that's, that's why listen, I love uh, doing it every coward, day. <laughs> a, coward, a coward dies every day. Uh, they're only going to get me once. <laughs> okay. Uh, let me uh, let me give you an example of how far this goes back. Here in America, spelled with a K, America, there's a guy named Sir Thomas Dale. Anybody ever heard of Sir Thomas Dale? Uh, he was a... Uh, he was a big shot back in uh, around uh, 1620, uh, 1615, 1620, in uh, uh, a little place called Jamestown. Anybody ever heard of Jamestown? Jamestown on the East Coast. In I don't in know. Did they play football Virginia. this week? Yeah. What's their yeah, mascot? No, I, he, I, 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 he was the quarterback. He was the oh, okay. quarterback for the for the syndicate called the the Virginia Company <laughs> back there, back there, sixteen twenty, yes sir. <laughs> and uh, he was he was the big boss. Yeah, Thomas Dale. Let's see, sixteen twenty. That's uh, how many how many years before that uh, revolution? Uh, well, somebody do the math 1775, 76, 1620. Uh, we'll just call it a, we'll just round it off at 150 years. 150 years, yeah, that's pretty close. Well, he's 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 the big shot, he's the big shot in uh, in uh, Jamestown. And he says, uh, I'm, I'm gonna give you a part of it, it's what's called Dale's Law, Dale's Law in Jamestown. Here it is. It says, No manner of person whatsoever, contrary to the word of God, shall detract, slander, cal 
Caluminate, murmur, mutiny, resist, disobey, or neglect the commandments either of the Lord Governor. Who, who calls himself Lord? Somebody with a God complex? The Lord Governor and a Captain General and Lieutenant General, the Marshal, the Council, or any authorized Captain, Commander, or Public Officer upon pain for the first so offending to be whipped. 30 times and upon his knees to acknowledge his offense, asking for forgiveness upon the Sabbath day in the assembly of the congregation and for the second time so offending to be condemned to the galley for three years and for the third time so offending to be punished with death. <laughs> so says Thomas Dale. Yeah, so... Uh, you know, no, no manner, no manner and joy in the conduct of evil has ever been done. So, so um, justifiably under the pretenses of, of God. (laughs) (laughs) They'll joyfully go out and commit all kinds of atrocities under the, with the, uh, uh, behind the veil and the pretense of, you know, God. So uh, this is 1620, and uh, this is this is uh, English uh, English colonies, corporate colonies in America, and that is a direct parallel to what Mike just said was going on in Missouri. That is a direct connection between social credit system in China, which is actually now here. Uh, they, 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 didn't have, they didn't have Facebook and technology back then, but they did have the word of God that they could use <laughs> to enforce uh, their implied powers against your sedition that you might have an opinion. Oh, DW, uh, could yeah. we, yeah. could we, uh, could we jump down the road a little bit and look at Samuel Bryan when he said in his essays of Sentinel that they will be able to get this Constitution foisted on the people because they will wrap it in the robes of divinity. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mike? Yeah. Well, that. Sir! Yeah. yeah it, uh, last week's lesson, or, or uh, Whistling Dixie, you'd commented on how Reconstruction began in the North and it began primarily in the churches, which would mean that all of the churches are reconstructed towards socialism, as long as all the Southern churches, so that uh, people, you know, in, in your religion, in your church, you need to understand you are in a reconstructed church. This is a government. It's it's not much different than a government school. These churches, they're 501c3s. They're government entities. <laughs> uh, they get special privileges for obeying the government. They, they, I, how do you explain this to people that go to church all the time, that your church probably more often than not, is teaching you socialist principles. <laughs> Do they teach you to stand up and shoot the redcoats when they come and try and take your rights? Or do they teach you to just go along with the government and go vote for more of it? Well, Cal, uh, that uh, what you mentioned, what you mentioned, a uh, great point, what you mentioned and what I had said previously about Reconstruction began in the churches. And that is true because the churches during the 1830s through the 1860s, especially in New England and in most of the northern states, was either uh, transcendentalism or Unitarianism. And the transcendentalists were preaching from the pulpit that you are your own Christ. And of course, the Unitarians were teaching there is no Christ. So they uh, then that was the source uh, many times of those beginnings of the Republican Party through those churches, because those churches were supporting abolitionism. Now, they wanted blacks to be free. They just didn't want them to live where they lived. 
So, uh, you know, you guys can be free in the South all you want to. Just please don't come North because if you do, we'll put a tax on you and we will, uh, you know, cause you all kinds of problems. Stay in the South, but we want you to be free. And that was what the abolitionists were doing. Then the abolitionists promoted people like John Brown, who was traveling into Kansas, killing people, and then into Harper's Ferry, killing people. You know, nothing, You, uh, how better can you liberate someone from a terrible circumstance than just kill them? So that's what was oh, happening. Right. When, John Brown, when John Brown goes back to the churches, John Brown is hailed as God's avenging angel. And then, to finish my point, D.W., then the thing that happens is after the war, the law of Northern aggression, after the war is over, those transcendentalists and Unitarians move south. And your normal preachers were removed from the pulpits. The, the Trinitarian, Trinitarianism and the others, uh, I mean, it was out. But the totalitarianism and the uh, Unitarians moved into the pulpits in the South and started teaching the same stuff there. Every service, it's documented, every service, every church service started with a prayer to the government. Not a prayer to God, a prayer to the government. Isn't that what and, the pledge is? Yes, exactly. The same thing. I pledge allegiance, yes, uh, you know, uh, to a flag, you know, and that is what just absolutely blows me away today, especially when every time I've been to a Sons of Confederate veteran meeting and they start off the whole thing with a, a salute and a pledge to the flag that killed their uh, ancestors, raped their ancestors and destroyed their property. So let's make sure we pledge that thing, okay? Let's get, let's make sure we do that, okay? If if there's any mention of that Confederate battle flag over there, we'll talk about that later. But the first thing we have to do is to pledge undying allegiance to the flag that destroyed the consent of the governed clause in the Declaration of Independence. And somebody take me out of here before I get mad. Hey, Mike, I yes, have something to kind of add to that. Please, sir. It's kind, Please. Of, it's kind of like uh, Richard Pryor's uh, album, The Bicentennial N-Word. Uh, in there, uh, they're asking a slave, are you thankful, thankful? Yes, I'm massa. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm massa. I'm thankful. Yeah, I'm so right. thankful. Yeah. Good point, Brent. Great point. Well, actually, very good. I love that voice. Uh, if, if the... Uh, actual objective was the freeing of black slaves for the purpose of equality there would have absolutely been no need none zero nada nothing to uh in the legislation of this thing called the 14th amendment that is bogus to begin with on its face uh the emancipation the manumission uh the end result, if the objective was the freedom and equality, liberty and fraternity, was uh, was that uh, all they there was a political status those people could have assumed, endowed what? with. They could have been they could have been citizens of the state. Okay, the state of Virginia, like Robert E. Lee and his family. Uh, like uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln in Illinois. Uh, uh, he, uh, you know, pick your state, pick your person. They could have been a part of those communities with the same status uh, as those, those other white people. But no, 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 we, we got to do something special here. Got to do something special, right? So on its face, the evidence, the facts, and the outcome is that they're trying to build a, their their own their own creation, their own slave class, and so you you kind of have to understand what emancipation and manumission mean. And oh, and I, I'm not going to do that for you, uh, but let me give you a little history. If you go back into like I I like these 1600s. The 1600s are really good. OK, if you go back into the 1600s and the indenture of white slaves, they were indentured. 
You got to do two years, four years, five years, maybe 10 and your family. And you got to work on my tobacco plants. My, you got to, you, you got to, you got to do all my manual labor and you got to live over there in that, in that, uh, bad building. And, uh, we're, we're going to work you like slaves. Yeah, they were slaves, but if they did survive and only one out of four did, See, indenture was usually, even if you were white, English, Scottish, Irish, you were white and you traveled, you indentured yourself to the company in the Virginia company and in, in all these other companies, English companies, only one out of four survived. Indenture was a death sentence. So for the 25% that did survive, guess what they got? They got their freedom. Well, they got their freedom to, to go out and chop wood for themselves and do for themselves. All right. 75% the of them died. But once, once you got through your indenture, if you survived it, okay, you got to, you got to have this thing called well, you got to be like a freeman, an English freeman. All right. But you weren't free till then. You weren't freeman. You weren't un under the common law of England. You didn't have the same rights of an Englishman because you had to lean them. You had indentured yourself. You had contracted yourself. You lost your freedom through contract. You get it? That's what well, hey, the DW. federal citizen does for you. Yeah. Well, DW, while you're uh, getting tired sitting over there on the sidelines doing nothing, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let me let me uh, let me throw a question for you and Cal and anyone else who would like to uh, participate. Uh, Brent would love for you to jump in here too. Uh, taking the Emancipation Proclamation, which you mentioned, DW, taking that proclamation. And boiling it down to its bare essence, what did it say, D.W.? Uh, to its bare essence? Yes. The Emancipation Proclamation? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, yeah, well, uh, you, you, you people in the South are free. Uh, you black people are South and the free, but, but don't come up here. And by the way... Uh, uh, yeah, we, we can't really help you out down there. So, uh, I don't... Uh, Cal, uh, jump in. Uh, it also said that you're you're free <laughs> if you're, you know, if you're in the South that we don't occupy. And this is only a wartime measure. So, you know, once the war's over, you probably go back to being a slave. Uh, Brent, you have any comments, sir? No, I'm not as well-schooled on the subject. Sorry. Well, thanks. Uh, uh, the thing that I see when I boiled it down, and I've looked at it for 40 years now, the bottom line of the Emancipation Proclamation is, people, you can own all of the slaves you want to as long as you support the government. If you don't support the government, your slaves are free. I uh, I welcome opposing viewpoints. <laughs> that goes along with the social credit score you just described. <laughs> exactly. We're right back at the same place. The Emancipation Proclamation freed all of the slaves in the South while it kept all of the slaves in bondage in all of the northern states and in any space occupied by the Union Army. So, in other words, that is the bottom line. People, you can own all of the slaves you want for as long as you want, as long as you support this government. You support this government? No, nope, your slaves are free. Please well, that's, saying the, the, that, that's saying the government is in support of slavery. Exactly. Oh, wait, that's what they're wasn't doing it, all of this anyway, isn't it? Hey, wait a minute. Wasn't it in the Constitution? Yeah. Wasn't slavery in the Constitution? Didn't the Supreme Court say con that uh, slavery was legal? Yeah. Okay, the government has backed it up. 
did not uh, Lincoln in his first inaugural address say, I will not interfere with the institution of slavery in the states where it exists because I do not have the power to do so? Well, it's exactly what he said. And then when his war wasn't well, going the way he needed to, when it wasn't working out like he wanted, he had to come up with a high moral ground. Okay, we're going to move into the South and we're going to kill men, women, and children who aren't in the military by the thousands, and we're going to kill probably about a million black folks while we're doing this, but we're doing it to free the slaves, okay? Was that kind of like bringing freedom well, and democracy to like Iraq and Iran and all that? Yes, uh, yeah, deliver it with bombs, though. But make sure you do. Yeah. <laughs> yes, make sure you deliver your democracy with bombs, yes. Oh man, love love bombs. There, there was a song. There was a song out there. Love love bomb. Uh, Will you yeah. sing it for uh, D W? So this is no, because we, okay. we've only got about we've only got about twenty people here, and I don't want to lose eighteen of them. So uh, uh, <laughs> and this is this is they 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 move into a uh, a stage of revolution. They they take a revolutionary stance. Of, of total warfare, total warfare, full full spectrum dominance, total warfare, uh, women and children, uh, everything is on the table. Uh, there's there's no difference in what uh, Sherman did and uh, some of these other different Marxist German socialist generals that were brought in here did. There was any different than firebombing um, Hamburg, Dresden, and uh, Dresden. And uh, so uh, <clears throat> this is this is where uh, it becomes acceptable to turn turn warfare on onto uh, men, women and children, animals. Uh, it continues with the American Indian. It continues in the trenches of World War One. It continues in the Transvaal and the Boer Wars in South Africa. It continues in World War Two. This is the unleashing the unleashing of the demons from hell. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> this, this enters a completely new stage of revolution. The, the, everybody points at the French Revolution as being this, oh, this terrible thing and cutting off their heads. That French Revolution didn't have nothing on what Sherman did. Okay, didn't have nothing. But see, you see that? You know, if you're going to be exceptional and indispensable, you have to believe it otherwise, don't you? Right. So if you if you have to if you want to feel good about yourself and believe all the mythology, then see, then, then you're going to believe what John Barton and, and uh, what's her face tells you and Tucker and, and, and the rest of them. See, you, you know, you know, what's really got these people in trouble it isn't 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 the liberals and the, and the Democrat, the socialists and the Marxists. What's really got you in trouble is these. These fake, these fake patriots, these fake Republicans, those are the ones that got you in trouble. That doesn't mean that the left's are, the left is right, but you're, you're following, you're taking your lead from the wrong mouth. You should be using your own head. And uh, uh, so, uh, Cal, pull me out of the, pull me out of the ditch here. Well, you're doing just fine, D-Dub. Oh, okay. You got it in oh. four wheel drive. Just keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm hey, gonna don't have stop to, now, I'm man. You got the tire. The... You got you got momentum going. Keep going. <clears throat> keep those tires turning. I got to hit the nitrous button here. Uh, nitrous button here and get the wheel spinning here. But uh, so uh, yeah, I I don't uh, I don't know. Just kind of going back here. I just don't know. You know, if we have any room to play with this going forward because. Uh, they're going to have they're going to have total total lockdown on all the infrastructure and the resources, the material, and uh, you know these things that Mike and Cal and I and what well, you people you know say online. It's, it's all it's all going to go away very soon. Okay, it, it you, you do realize this. Okay, that that like Mike said earlier that you know all of us that do this. Uh, we're, we're going to be on the short list. Man. All right. But <clears throat> um, 
So, you know, if you're if you're if you're over 60 years old and you're you're thinking you're going to you're saving yourself from something, you're a fool. <laughs> you know, I you know, uh you you're being foolish. Uh and uh, uh you know, the the men and women in their then their 20s and 30s, you know, look at look at the nightmare that if they survive what they would have to live through uh from 2030 going forward you know you might you might be able to find uh, some sort of relief and and uh soothe your conscience uh for the next three four five maybe six years but uh unless this thing gets turned around and in a in a fairly radical way after 2030 it's over okay completely Done. I think I think they'll you're have it. Giving, they'll have it. Yeah. I think you're giving it too much time, DW. Well, I mean, it goes in stages, right? Uh, uh, they they have a 2025 deadline. Uh, the 2025 deadline, uh, according to my the, the notes they give me, they give me notes, right? And <clears throat> the 2025 deadline is the uh, the the new uh, transaction currency. The currency but it has to be in implemented and and being used by 2025 between 2025 and 2030 is when that period of time is when you will be systematically dispossessed remember klaus klausy schwab who's just a front man and okay he's obviously not the guy thinking this stuff up okay uh, he says, by 2030, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy if you're alive. Okay. So there's a five-year period where they're going to use this, this capital transition. Remember, look at that, that word I use, capital. They're going to use this capital transition to dispossess you and everybody else of everything. All right. <clears throat> well, DW, so, if I, mean, I may... Yeah. If I may, let me throw this in there. Uh, Klaus Schwab, uh, you don't have to wait for 2030 because in America today you own nothing because the government can take any damn thing that you own yeah. away from you uh, without uh, very little effort on their part. They can rob you. Uh, you, uh, you think you own your property. You really don't. You're leasing it from the government. Just don't pay your lease payment and see what happens. And the thing of it is, the happy part, I tell you what, just go to a college football game. You think people aren't happy right now and they own nothing? That's a small transitory step, my friend. It is. You're right. Yeah, that 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 thing that thing you call a tax is actually a feudal tenure. That's a feudal that's your feudal tenure and you're paying your landlord. And uh, this is the same thing that happened. Let me now let me give the people that are, are uh, hanging out with us here. Um, this is called if you if you went online and you you did a little search and you said uh, typed in like the the enclosure act uh, in England enclosure act England and and what you'll come up with is I think it was around 1789. They had, they had like a quarter million people on the land. In, I think, five years, that was reduced to 35,000, if I remember right. From a quarter million down to 35,000 people that actually had access to the land. Where did the rest of them go? They went to the cities to supply the labor for the Industrial Revolution. But the Enclosure Act was to drive them there. If I may. Yeah. Jumping yeah. Up. Two, uh, two items. Number one does. Oh, give me just a second. One second. <laughs> it's 
Time's up, Robert. <laughs> I apologize. A very noisy vehicle just passed by that I had to mute out. Uh, two items. Number one, does anyone on this broadcast know the difference between a college athletic director and God? I thought not. God, God answers to the college athletic director, doesn't he? Actually, no. God oh. doesn't think he's an athletic director. Oh, okay. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. But seriously, folks, in a conversation I had earlier this morning with the um, with the all-knowing, all-seeing Dr. Gaddy, I mentioned to him that I was taken aback by an epiphany I had about a week or so ago. I found out that uh, Mother Teresa, <clears throat> who the world looks at as some great person, was anything but. Why? Because apparently she was involved with the Catholic Church in that she was supplying the church with young girls for sex purposes, and in so doing, she enriched herself, along with uh, some charity she ran and which collected $100 million, most of which didn't go work here where it was supposed to go, but probably went in her pocket. And I was shocked to hear that she was involved in that. Now, why would that be shocking? Well, that kind of goes back to what Daryl was saying in the opening minute. You think you know something, but you really don't. Why, why would I be surprised that, that Mother Teresa or any of these fools would do something that nefarious? Well, I shouldn't have been surprised, but that's what Daryl was saying. And until you face that hard reality, whoop, and it's hard, <laughs> you really don't know anything. Thanks, Daryl, for making that illuminating um, uh, opening statement. It was really it was like, wow, wow. Oh, I appreciate that, Robert. Oh, I appreciate you. Appreciate you. I, it was heartfelt. So, and uh, I said a long time ago, I, years ago when Mike, uh, Mike and I were hanging out and doing some things, and I, 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 I made the comment. I said, I, I said, I, I, I said, I, I, can, I either want to enrage you or inspire you. At this point, I don't really care which. And, uh, but I, I guess I would say, I, I would, I would hope that people would be in, find, uh, find uh, the inspiration, you know, that, uh, you can walk away from your mistakes if you acknowledge them. Okay. What about both? Enragement and, and inspiration. Well, that's it. That's, that's, that's when you, uh, that's, that's when you put it all together. Yeah. You're enraged and inspired. <laughs> So, two-fisted comeback but that's <laughs> yeah <laughs> so mike cal sarge we we survived the first hour so do we dare open the open the open it up to everybody else sir go Please. for it we, we might as well huh yep okay everybody unmute let us have it <laughs> okay Wake up first. All right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, well, uh, let's see. Uh, while we're waiting for that to happen, uh, I I just want to uh, also recommend. You know, I've said it before, and I'm gonna I'm just gonna keep saying these things because they're the they're the basics. Uh, I highly recommend the book uh, White Cargo, and. Uh, there's more in there than just about talking about white slaves. It talks about white slaves, black slaves, white and in white indentured slaves. By the way, there were black indentured slaves. Okay. And, and, and racist slavery. Okay. That racist slavery didn't really happen until the 1700s, early 1700s. Okay. So there was through the 1600s, whether you black or white, you could gain your freedom. And this is this is lost. And of course, they don't talk about any of this stuff. You know, Cal, Mike, uh, they they this whole thing about this uh, pseudo pseudo history is that you, when you talk to anybody. Their idea of America actually starts, well, they'll say something about pilgrims. They'll say something about Thanksgiving. And then all of a sudden, 
we fast forward 150 years and we had a revolution. <laughs> okay. They leave everything out in between and they actually leave out, they leave out everything that, that activity in America, uh, particularly from an English point of view, really comes in and around initially really starts 1575 200 years 200 years before the constitution and and uh, about 40 40 45 years before the pilgrims show up okay there's there's like 45 50 years of history in America with the colonies and the companies before the pilgrims and the Puritans ever show up. And by the way, the Puritans were not interested in democracy. They weren't, they weren't interested in any form of liberal form of government. They weren't interested in liberty and freedom for all. If you go look at their charters. <laughs> Okay, they were uh, uh, they they were all on board with slavery, indentured slavery, and brutal punishment. And as a matter of fact, there was some other people living around the Pilgrims who actually did embrace some uh, what you might call economic and, and uh, liberty and freedom-minded principles and lived that way, and the pilgrims attacked them. Okay. Uh-oh. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm doing it again, Mike. <laughs> Cal. <laughs> I'm blowing, I'm blowing up bubbles here. <laughs> so, no, I, I, I find, you know... Yeah. The fact that, you know, there were, you know, indentured whites and blacks, it's like, okay, people, how do you explain the free black people that lived in America? Where did they come from? I mean, where, well, yeah. where was that ever addressed, you know? Wait a minute, there were Cal. free, you know, uh, am I supposed to ask these questions? How did they become a free black person? Oh, wait, they came over indentured, maybe. <laughs> or maybe they just came here and settled themselves, yeah. but they came over indentured, earned their freedom, and now they were a free black person. Living in the North and in the South. <sighs> yeah. yeah, you actually had, during this period of time, you actually had uh, generationally free black families that owned or had control of white Place. indentured uh, slaves. Yeah. Uh, well, gentlemen, uh, 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 if I may, <laughs> if I may, let me quote from one of the most brilliant men in America who just happens to wear a black skin. But without a doubt, I believe he is, as I said, not to be totally redundant, but this man is so intelligent, it's scary. I have the good fortune to have heard him twice in person. But let me read to you what the wonderful Dr. Thomas Sowell has written, and I quote, More whites were brought as slaves to North Africa than blacks brought as slaves to the United States or to the 13 colonies from which it was formed. White slaves were still being bought and sold in the Ottoman Empire decades after blacks were freed in the United States, unquote. Again, Dr. Thomas Sowell. Right. And if, if you ever, uh, to, to piggyback on Thomas Sowell, if you really ever wanted to read something that accurately described Marxism, you'd read his book, Thomas Sowell's book, Marxism. And uh, uh, that was recommended to me, and I just want to pass it on. He's uh, he's a brilliant man, and uh, uh, well, if you want it's, a it's really good to, lesson, uh, yeah. you want a really yeah. good lesson on Marxism. Just listen to the United States government on any occasion. I was going to say read the Constitution. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's, it's socialist policies and communist policies inside of it. 
Well, isn't it wonderful how everyone, you know, says, oh, our democracy, we're going to spread democracy with bombs and guns and bullets. But we have a democracy when Marx himself said that democracy was the first step to full blown communism. Yeah. Well, but yeah. Well, we can't so, remember that, right? Yeah. Well, for democracy to work, yeah. the individual so, has to surrender their own free will, their own liberty. Article 1, Section 8, Clause 1. Yeah. Look, clause 3, regulate well, you, commerce. You, that's, yes. control of the, that's control of the, the economy, isn't it? Yes, and then Article 1, Section 8, Clause 18, the Necessary and Proper Clause, and then Article 6, Clause 2, the Supremacy Clause, says that government can do any thing it wants to, any time it wants to, for any purpose it wants to, and you better sit down and shut up or you'll find yourself in jail or dead. So with those few and defined powers, you have a socialist government. Absolutely. It was intended to be socialist right out of the get-go. Uh, before they knew it, socialism. Before yeah, they before, coined the word socialism. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. a hundred years before Marx was born. Well, well, well wait a minute, yeah. Uh, socialism was understood very well. Uh uh, much earlier than uh, most people have <clears throat> been given the impression. Yeah. Uh, everybody, everybody's fed this line that socialism is this creation of Marxism. Well, it, it's not. No, nope. uh, uh, I'm not saying I'm not saying Marx was a, a, a dumb guy. He he wasn't. Uh, he was, you know, he obviously had a pretty high IQ. If you can, put any value in that for whatever reason uh he's mostly a uh, a clever constructor of concepts and he's well read he's also a plagiarist <laughs> okay and uh and he's being subsidized quite nicely to to be a sit around sit around uh sit around boy he, he sits around his whole life being subsidized uh, uh, by his friends, Engel, his friend, Engel, uh, Engels, uh, anybody ever look into the background on Engels? Well, he's a capitalist. <laughs> okay. This is what, this is, this is another one of those examples of, uh, you might have something wrong if you thought Marx was anti-capitalist because he wasn't. Now, if you just heard me say that, and prior to me me saying that, you thought that he was anti-capitalist, he was fighting the capitalist, then right there is one of those deals that you had wrong. And so all those thoughts, presumptions, that percolated out of your false presumption that Marx was fighting capitalism or capitalism was fighting Marx, Every all those things that cascaded and precipitated out of that for your entire life, you have to now go back and relook at. What you're saying yeah, is everything you were taught was controlled opposition. Basically. Say again, Cal. I say I didn't mean to interrupt. I think it was uh, Brent was trying to, or Robert was trying to say something. But um, so what you're saying is, you know, all this that you were taught was controlled opposition. They've controlled yeah, both yeah, sides yeah. of the narrative. And they tell yeah. you this so that you get caught up in this fight, in this narrative, and you don't see the bigger picture. They, they keep you in, confined in this little box. And they let you argue about this little bit of stuff. But true freedom and true liberty is all outside of that box. And you're not allowed to look yeah, outside very good. of it. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. That's very well said. Yeah. So, and that's, that's a really good example. Go ahead. Somebody. Um, Moses Mordecai, Mordecai Levi is, uh, uh, AKA Carl Heinrich Marx. Oh, the melodious, pulchritudious tones of myrrh. <laughs> uh, and haven't, hasn't football been traded in for the kangaroo court of Alex Jones, AKA actually is bill hicks but we don't want to talk about that i was told oh who told you that Murr? guess 
<laughs> the show I just came from. Oh, you. He called me out, you, so you I can, had to. You can talk. <laughs> you can talk about it here. Uh, well, it's a fact. Yes, uh, Mur. If you need to be abused and yelled at and screamed at, you uh, need to go back to the previous show. <laughs> yeah, that's over with. I'm I'm accustomed to a raised voice now and then, <laughs> but it won't it won't deter me from the truth. So, uh, uh, Mike. Tell us, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit more about the uh, what was going on in Missouri with these uh, these sedition, these sedition laws. Well, it was it was real from. simple. See, here was the thing, and I don't think most people know this: is that when um, Lincoln ordered the various states governors to provide troops to invade the seven states that had seceded at that time, I don't think he expected what he got. Because what happened was four southern states that had voted not to secede said, oh, no, 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 we're not putting up with that. No, you're not ordering us to provide troops so the federal government can invade our sister states for wanting to determine their own outcome, the ability to, to decide. That is the very base element. You can decide to join or you can decide you don't join. If you don't have a choice, you are not free. And so those four states very quickly said, oh, no, no, you're, we're not providing you anything. And uh, uh, the elector, the governor of Virginia, actually said, well, we will uh, raise a battalion of troops, but it will be to defend ourselves from you. We're not going to provide troops for this. So then suddenly Lincoln is looking at a huge problem. He's got Maryland, which surrounds DC on three sides. Uh oh, we can't let them secede because if we do, we are trapped. So, okay, we'll send troops in there. We'll stop that. Okay, we cannot let Kentucky secede because it provides too many assets to the north uh, against the north. We cannot allow that to happen. And we sure as hell can't allow Missouri to secede. So we will just send troops in there to remove their consent. And even though the state of Missouri was able to actually vote on secession and vote to secede they were on the run being chased by the Union Army when they did so. So the legislature voted to secede. The governor signed it in October, I believe, of 1861. They completed it. And then the governor, the uh, legislature of M Missouri had to actually get the hell out of Missouri. First, they went to Arkansas. The governor died in Arkansas. And then they moved to Texas. Because that's how invasive Lincoln's army was. And so it was the very effect. You either do what we tell you to do or we'll kill you. Now, you can call that a good form of government, you know, as much as you want to. And you can build a monument, a granite monument to that crazy SOB if you want to on the banks of the Potomac. You can do that. But it doesn't change the fact that it. Lincoln's government was do what you are told by the government or you lose everything you have, including your life. Pretty simple, actually. And people don't think the government won't do that again. <laughs> <This> government. <laughs> didn't it, didn't it work the first time? Yeah. Did they ever stop? No, Not they've really. never stopped. No. Well, never. How do you, uh, how do you how do you build how do you build out the infrastructure the material infrastructure uh, railways uh, buildings mining farm production uh, military uh, the superstructure how do you how do you materially build that out in a uh, 
communist country. Well, you, you, you don't. It, it's never been done. <laughs> okay. If, as, if you hadn't noticed, uh, the, the Soviet Union, uh, Republic, the Republic of the Soviet Union was, was pretty inept uh, at doing anything. Uh, of its own volition and initiative, uh, merit, energy. Uh, it surely didn't use its own capital, did it? How does a how does a communist country like the Soviet Union build build commerce without capital? How do you build infrastructure without capital? Well, you you, you don't. So this is this is part of this contradiction, okay. So uh, this uh, this this whole this whole thing from the Civil War period going forward, there's a vast expansion in infrastructure being built in the United States uh, post Civil War. Railways, industry, uh, mining, uh, industrial technology, uh, farming, and uh, it's it's an explosion. Now it's it's being driven by the work of the people. So the people are doing the work. All right in the farms, in the factories, in the offices, and, and they're being paid. And this is, this is this sort of general idea of what capitalism means. A capitalist economy means uh, to the average uh, Jane John Doe worker, uh, churchgoer on the street, in the country, in the county. They're part of this this great manifest destiny of American work ethic and uh, freedom, liberty, independence, the the American way, and uh, what what are some other those uh, dogmatic, axiomatic, uh, Pavlovian knee jerk uh, phraseology, and this is what this all means to the the average uh, guy. Uh, going forward through the rest of the 1800s and then into the 1900s. Well, of course, then you have the labor movement uh, and all this sort of thing. And you have, uh, well, you had labor movements in the late 1800s too, uh, in the industrialized uh, parts of the country. And, the, and but who, who is funding these labor movements? Oh, the capitalists. <laughs> Uh, who's involved in these labor movements? Prussian, Prussian, Russian, no, not Russian, Prussian, German Jews and, and Germans. And, and they're being funded by capitalists and being given support and logistics. And this is terrorizing or causing great consternation amongst the industrialists. And, and the industrialists then are going to side with the capitalist. Now, what am I talking about here? This is the great irony of it. Okay, <laughs> this is this is the part. This is the part you have to you, you have to love this. I'm going to give you another example of how this works. This is how this works. This is divide and conquer. This is what's been done to you your whole lives, and 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 your parents and their parents. It was labor versus business. Not, not really. Okay, so by subsidizing and instigating labor, the capitalists, the money power, drives businesses and corporations to the feet of the money power. You can, if you're the capitalist, you can control the businesses, not only through your capital, but by labor terror, terrorizing them with their own labor. And you drive them, you drive them to do your bidding or, or become uh, even more dependent upon you. 
So the irony of it is, is that the, the business and corporations uh, were, were looking to protection from capital while capital was actually funding the source of their fears. The, I hope you're, I hope you're seeing this. This is, this is how you, you divide and conquer and create a feedback loop. And this is capital. Uh, capitalism. So I, uh, and, and you, you can't, uh, you, you cannot, you just absolutely cannot break free of these chains as long as uh, that you have submitted yourself to the debt of the federal uh, private banking. Okay. You, you can never be free. Uh, we'll never be free ever. Uh, this is why I, I won't pay him. I, I don't pay him. <laughs> I'm, I won't do it. Uh, I, I suppose I might get in trouble someday, but you know, I've been in trouble before, <clears throat> but, uh, anyway, they're going to they're gonna uh, come and take everything you own. Like they're going to do it anyway. So why pay them to do it? Right. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So, um, uh, that's, uh, so that, that this is this is how this this is how this works out. So um, the stage two, uh, the Civil War is is kind of like stage two of the socialist plan. And socialism definitely is is its its foundations are 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 printed in the in the revolution um, in the constitutional convention, that's where it, it locks in its foundations, its legitimacy, its premises uh, under the rule of law. That's, that's where it gets its premise. And then when it's challenged by what people think, see the South thought it was a Republic, Mike, didn't it? Didn't it? Weren't they operating on what most people would perceive as a Republican ideals when they succeeded? Yeah, most session. people did, most people today claim they're living under a republic DW. I know, I know. Well, we know that's uh, that's that's bogus. But by acting out through the act of succession, wasn't that what people who believed in a republican form of government would have done? Liz had a question. If uh, Liz, just go ahead and unmute and ask it. Please, Liz, do so. Yeah, um, I'm. I'm thinking about people who are in this destructive frame of mind and think that they're on top. Um, and, you know, in control. Uh, isn't this also going to wind up turning around on them? Everybody, the way, Liz. Yeah, this you're not protected yes. just because you're uh, in the know or you're Carl Schwab or uh, Soros or whoever. First of all, we're all going to stand before the judge in the end and somehow being uh, on top so to speak is not necessarily as good a place as you think it's going to be hey Liz yes what happened to Professor Frankenstein I thought he was fiction I actually <laughs> Well, even in fiction, what happened to the creator who created the monster? He was destroyed probably by the monster. I don't remember. The oh, of it. really? Really? Did they actually created a monster which then devoured them? Yeah. Oh, I, uh, I love that uh, concept. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes fiction is telling you more truth than you want to know. Absolutely. Yeah, I yield. Thanks, Liz. Anybody else jump so on Mike, in? Uh, yeah, please do. So, Mike, 
when people think they live under a Republican form of government, does what what do they think they're living under? Like what do you think that is? They don't they don't have a clue, DW. They don't have a clue what they're doing. They know more about the statistics of Major League Baseball and the NFL and college football than they do about their own government. They, they know much more about that. And the one thing I have found is do not, and I found this out last year, a huge, I was invited to a huge uh, group of people here who were watching Georgia play Alabama in football. Uh, just a, a bunch of people, you know, people brought food, they brought everything else, and they're cheering and they're yelling, and you could hear it, you know, no matter where you were in the immediate vicinity. These people were just absolutely fanatics about this football game, and suddenly I was asked a question, and I said, you know, how great would it be in America if people had this enthusiasm for rightful liberty? Well, you know what? I haven't been invited back to another game since. Wait till right. uh, the national championship game. Then you will be. <laughs> oh, I'm sure. No, yeah, I, won't, won't. That, I doubt that. Won't, won't, won't. <laughs> Mike, you're too much. You're too much. Mike, have you got at the tip of your uh, tongue or in within hand's reach the uh, seven um, uh, characteristics of a republic? I think that'd be fun well, to go over again. Well, if, if, if you guys will take just a minute here, I believe that this ignorant old rebel can find it. Just give me a moment. Yeah, that's something that uh, the few times I've heard you say that, uh, I've gone back and listened to it. I need to write them down. Um, that just really smacked me upside the head when I first heard those things. That We have never lived in a republic even though Ben Franklin allegedly said we had one if we could keep it. <laughs> well, Jim, he, he wouldn't lie. He was head of the Hellfire Club, where they, uh, uh, you know, where they had little children for sex objects. Don't well, forget Hellfire. that. Hellfire. Codename yeah. Ben Moses, the Epstein of his day. <laughs> oh, the, the, the colonial Epstein. Yes. Oh, way to go, Murr. <laughs> Did he have a... Uh, a a carriage or a wagon called the uh, the uh, Ben Franklin Express. <laughs> Little well, Express was, might have, might they, have. They covered the mail. Yeah, they they hauled the mail in it, uh, Jim. Yeah. Oh baby! I remember it was kind of a joke when they were teaching history that you know Ben Franklin slept here. It was everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was not unique, Mur. <laughs> Ben Franklin slept here was not unique. Mm -hmm. And isn't it strange, guys? Stop and think about this. Here was the guy in the Hellfire Club, and he's the guy who finally becomes exasperated and asks for daily prayers at the convention. How bad does it have to be for that guy to recognize that? No I kidding. think we missed that. Well, he... Uh... He, he obviously uh, had had not read one of the commandments where it says not do not use God, na God's name in vain. So uh, or God will not be mocked. Ben Ben, <laughs> ben Ben Franklin's using God like so many we hear so many other people do as um, as a marketing aid. He was trying to market and promote uh, what he wanted to accomplish there and. Uh, he he was more than willing to use uh, use that as a uh, as as a ploy to uh, to get everybody on board. So, but uh, was Alexander just, Hamilton wasn't having any of it. Yeah, he he wasn't faking, right? He was downright dirty through and through. <laughs> but Moses, Mordecai, Levi, Marx, also purported to be a Christian in the stuff he wrote. You know, so we got these double agents all over the place. Well, they did the same thing in 1954 when they placed the words under God in the Pledge of Allegiance, didn't they? Yep. Once again. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. And we actually are. It, we actually I haven't are found a, it yet. We actually Go are ahead, Murr. <laughs> we actually are in a democracy, you know, since 1933, bankruptcy, because that's what the banks wanted. That's what the IMF and the... Bank of Settlements and World Bank and everybody. 
through the UN, they wanted it a democracy. So whatever you call it, it doesn't matter. Well, the measures are. It's a. Uh, DW, you talk about the yeah. capitalists and the, the the entity behind the capitalist funding, you know, funding both sides, labor and capital. That was the banksters. That's when you peel right. back when you peel back all the layers of the onion and get to the core. That's where you're at. Capitalism <laughs> means well. I, I yes. Yeah, I I think I think uh, I think democracy as it's been animated uh, in this place is more likely called impotency. And I'm ready. All right, Go ahead. Mike. Right on. <laughs> oh, okay. The seven basic principles necessary to constitute a republic form of government. Number one, there is a strict separation of powers horizontally and vertically. Number two, the government is run by officers governing for a term and only during good behavior. Number three, offices are selected by our election and not by the appointment of government itself. Government can appoint no branches like the FBI, BATF. All of these agencies are totally outside the realm of a republic. Number well, four. The judiciary is. Yes, the judiciary is outside the form of a republic because it's appointed. Number four, the government recognizes that power resides only in the people, but immediately from God. Okay, number five, there is a deliberativeness in action, and that it is by the checks and balances not subject to the whimsical fancy of a few in society. Number six, the government acknowledges the final right of the people to alter or abolish it whenever it usurps the rights for which it was instituted by the people to administer God's law. Not man's law, God's law. Number seven, the government does not, in, does not grant entitlements to anyone. Those are the seven principles for a republic. Where did that come from, Mike? Well, that came from, Jim, I found this researching the archives at the University of Virginia. Hmm. And this was listed well before the uh, 1776. This was in the Virginia, uh, I, gosh, uh, Jim, if you'll give me, it'll probably take me longer than the, the program's going to take. But I'll find the original quote, and I will send that to you, sir, and you can share it. Great. I would appreciate it. That's, that's phenomenal. Well, so uh, I, I keep trying to make this point. Uh, under the Articles of Confederation for the Perpetual Union, the, the organization of the, of the uh, 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 Continental, Continental Congress uh, and it, its affiliation with those those uh, thirteen states was way more, uh, from what I can uh, divine, uh, pretty much meets those criteria that you just laid out, Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it was called confederation, but it that could have been a republic. It they was could a have confederation. It was it was a confederation of republics. Each state was its yeah. own republic. There you go. <laughs> right, yeah. right. It's a, yeah. And so it was so a confederation it, of republics. That's that's right. what it was. Yeah. And and the and the constitution and its federal constitution overthrows this. It's it's a it's a it's a cool. Oh, absolutely. It was a it was a revolution. It was a revolution in favor of aristocracy and the well-born. It was never intended. Uh, you know, this is the thing that just absolutely amazes me, people, is that people will still cherish this piece of parchment. Even tell them that they voted unanimously not to recognize the rights of the people in their constitution. What more do you need to know? 
<laughs> unanimously, they voted down a bill of rights for the people 10 to nothing by state. New York did not have a vote at that time. So how can we even mm. begin to believe that these, this group of people who would then, 68% of them, uh, who were at the Constitutional Convention would later hold office in the new government that they themselves had created. So what makes anyone think that they created a government for the wealthy and the well-born and that that government would protect the rights of the people they sought to tax to death? <clears throat> well, if they write it in the newspaper, they'll believe it. Yeah, that's and uh, or let Tucker, yeah. Sean Hannity, or uh, yeah, on, uh, TV or uh, Barton or uh, Chris Ann Hall or the Tenth Amendment Center. All they have to do is say that the government can't do this, and people who have sat and watched the government do it for two hundred and thirty years believe them. Mark, yeah. you have that little ditty yeah, you so put up on Facebook about a conversation with a, a constitutional scholar and. And a conservative or whatever it was. I've been looking for it and I can't find it. Which you one's had, that, Cal? You put up a conversation. You you made up a conversation between you know a constitution worshiper and, and someone like Chris Ann Hall, where they just kept you know, kept asking him questions and then she kept saying, Yeah, well if you keep paying me, I'll keep telling you this. I can't find it was a it was a really good little ditty you put up there and I can't find it. <laughs> That's the way it happens, you know, when you want to find something, it disappears. Well, anyway, Cal, can you trip over it? Cal, can you say pretty please? Pretty please. Okay, pretty buddy, please. I'll find it. <laughs> I'll find it. I'll, uh, I'll find it. I'll find it. It uh, uh, that that day I just couldn't help myself. That was the day the Tenth Amendment Center had told me how they don't listen to arrogant people like myself. Oh, well, I've been sensing the frustration. I mean, even Tuesday's chat. I mean, it, it went from a meeting to where, okay, guys, help me out. I got to think this through. And, and I could tell what was going on. You know, I, I could sense your frustration. And then, you know, uh, for DW, you could sense his, you know, even though he wants to be on the sideline, but wind him up and let that frustration out. And it's amazing what can happen when you let frustrations out. Well, Cal, can you believe that within like an hour of that being posted at Podbean, that uh, class on Tuesday night, that within an hour of that class being posted, there were 252 downloads? That's excellent. That's, yeah, it's, it's growing leaps and bounds. So anybody out there that wants to take advantage of it, his Telegram channel on chat on Tuesday nights, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting. I enjoy the heck out of it. Well, I was, uh, thank you, but uh, I was, uh, I, I got to admit, uh, I just wanted to talk with the people that I felt like I could trust, the people who are like-minded, who are in the group, and you were there, Cal. I just wanted to kind of let out the fact that, you know, what is it going to take? How bad is it going to have to be before people realize what is actually going on in this country? Yeah, that's well. That's the that's the general sense of frustration that this show started on. So it's it's just a continuation. It's been <laughs> hey, it's been awesome. You know they <laughs> they they used to say you know that's the that's the sixty four thousand dollar question you ask in there, and then you know it, because of inflation it became well that's the million dollar question. So now we're at the point of so oh, that's the life and death question, isn't it? Yeah, okay, I'm uh, ready here, Cal. Oh, I'm sorry, DW. No, no, I was. I was okay, just... here I will run. The, I'll run this by at the request and the pretty please of Mister Caledonia. Okay, here is what I posted: a true indicator of the intellectual vacuum that has consumed this country is the number of individuals and groups out there making money, teaching and telling the masses that the federal government cannot do what they have been doing daily for 234 years. So here's the discussion. The masses. Would you look at what the government just did? The charlatans like Chris Ann Hall and the 10th Amendment Center and David Barton. No, but they can't do that. Here, buy my DVD. 
or pay me to come tell you in person that they can't do that. The masses, okay, here's my money, but the government just did the same thing they have been doing for 234 years. The charlatans, not to worry. They really can't do that. And I have an online lesson for $300, which will illustrate why they can't do that over and over again. The masses, well, here's my credit card for the class. But please explain for me how they just did something today, which you teach and claim they can't do. By the way, the government did what you said they can't do again. And I'm in jail, and I just had a preliminary hearing wherein the government judge told me that the government can do whatever they, they please. Oh, and by the way, can I still get your lectures and DVDs while I'm in prison? Unquote. <laughs> That's excellent. So there you have it, Cal. Thank oh. you. Thank you very much. <laughs> oh. That was good. That's a That's <clears throat> classic. Well, don't forget what my grandpa said. Even a blind acre and finds uh, even a blind squirrel finds an acre in every once in a while. Yep. <sighs> hey, we haven't had much audience participation except for Liz and Murr. Are the yeah. ladies going to lead the way? Brent. Well, oh, I'm not going to call Brent a Brent lady. Robert you can it. if you want, but I'm not going no. to. Well, no. <laughs> I'm no. I'm, he's, he's too big for that. <laughs> so. I'm not going to call him. Uh, for a lady. <laughs> I'm not going to call him anything sitting way over here where he can't reach me. Well. You got to be careful with Brent. He could reach out and touch you. you yeah, know. buddy. <laughs> <laughs> the original so, long uh, distance. Anyway, yeah. Reach out. What and touch was? Uh, yeah. Uh, hey, Mike. So yes, sir. Brent, go ahead. <laughs> oh, did you ever uh, find out what Bujin Khan Taijutsu was? I have not, sir. Are you going to illuminate my path? No, you can look it up. I don't want to make it public or anything. But okay, I'll keep I remember looking. You, yeah, I remember you had snuck up on me outside the theater in that moment. Oh, and I thought you couldn't be sneaked up upon. Oh, well. <laughs> I think I think my wrapping you up kind of wrapped that up. <laughs> oh well, Brent, I got to tell you, it was just a, a you know, a, folks. Pardon me, it's been almost a year now. October the eighteenth, there in Gadsden, we're getting very close to a one-year anniversary. One of the real true pleasures there was to get to sit down that night before and have dinner and sit across from Brent and that beautiful lady of yours and have our discussions and talk about stuff. Uh, you know, there, you know, and I'm getting ready to go to fall for Dixie, uh, here on the 29th in Travelers Rest, South Carolina. Again, folks, if you haven't been to a group, I know it's fun for us to all sit here and talk and, you know, banner back and forth and everything else. But until you have stood in the presence of other people who feel the same way you do and who understand what we're going through, you know, if you, you know, one of the pleasures in life is actually getting to stand near the same people, talk to the same people. It is a blessing from the good Lord. I promise you that. So if you ever have the opportunity to go to uh, and uh, don't expect a large crowd, it's not going to happen. But the people who truly matter, the remnant are special people. They really are. And you feel it in their presence. I know I do. And it, it's, it's just like having sustenance. It's to be with them and to listen to them and to talk to them. And you hear what they're saying and you feel their emotions. It is like... Uh, you know, it's like food. It's like food for the soul. And that's enough of my ranting. So uh, go ahead, folks. Hmm. Well, uh, uh, I'll just, uh, I'll try to, I'll try to uh, 
round out some of the things I was saying about uh, earlier here. Um, if if you're looking at at any situation that is present before us at this moment, anything that's being talked about in the media, it doesn't matter where it's in the medical, whether it's Ukraine, whether it's the government, and you are not taking full appreciation and bringing into that process capital, you will never, ever have a chance of recognizing uh, the, uh, the play. This is, once you fully get your mind around how all-encompassing and controlling capital is, this is the banking power. They call it the banking. I think that's a misnomer. I, I don't think it does it justice. Uh, you can call it the syndicate. You could call it the money power. Uh, it goes beyond just banking that people have in their mind. If you do not bring this into your understanding to identify the contradictions, You'll, you'll always be left vulnerable to the Sean Hannity's, the Rush Limbaugh's, the Donald J. Trump's. Donald J. Trump is a perfect example of a step and fetch it for his masters. He is not his own man. Well, Never D. has w been. DW, do you have a moment for uh, me to quote none other than Andrew Jackson of, on your subject? Oh, please. Pretty please. Okay. Quote, <laughs> it is not our own citizens only who are to receive the bounty of our government. More than 8 millions of the stock of this bank, talking about the Bank of <laughs> the United States, more than 8 millions of the stock of this bank are held by foreigners. Is there no danger to our liberty and independence in a bank that in its nature has so little to bind it to our own country? Controlling our currency, receiving our public money, and holding thousands of our citizens' independence would be more formidable and dangerous than a military power of any enemy. If government would confine itself to equal protection and as heaven does its reigns, shower its favor alike on the high and the low, the rich and the poor, it would be an unqualified blessing. In the act before me, there seems to be a wide and unnecessary departure from these just principles. This is what he wrote before he vetoed the Bank of the United States. Absolutely. Uh, well, that's extremely well said. Uh, I'd like to, I should probably have that quote. Uh, the, one, of the, one of the major proponents of free market, or uh, excuse me, free trade was Karl Marx. He proposed free trade. And he wanted free trade. He wanted free trade because it would irritate labor and make them fight against the capitalists or the businesses even more to incite them. Mm. So this this was not a man. This was not a man. He was cunning. He was clever, and he was he was leveraging divide and conquer. Uh, well, we're going to, uh, and and he's working for the capitalist. Okay, is is Karl Marx a capitalist? Well, not in the sense that he has any money. He's working for the capitalists. He's subsidized by the capitalists. So after, after he gets kicked out of Germany during the failed. 1848 to 1850 revolution where does where does marx go in 1850 anybody got a guess where does he leave for france first and ends up in london well, he 
<laughs> he ends up in London. Right. He started in London. Uh, right. Hey, and, what's in London? He, <laughs> capital. The Bank of England. It's got a lot of cap. It has a lot of capital. Hey, DW. It has a lot of capital. Let yeah. let me let me run something by the folks here as we're running out of time, please. And I think it's important that people know this. But in uh, 18, I believe it was 1838, when they did away with the uh, uh, centralized bank, uh, you know, and of course the bankers had to move and bring us a uh, civil war in about 20 some years. But here is uh, what happened with the central bank destroyed. Fractional reserve banking moved like a virus through the state chartered banks, instead causing the instability this form of economics thrives on. When people lose their homes, someone else wins them for a fraction of their worth. Depression is a good news to a lender, but war causes even more debt and dependency than anything else. So if the money changers couldn't have their central bank with a license to print money, a war it would have to be. We can see from this quote of the then Chancellor of Germany that slavery was not the only cause for the American Civil War. The division of the United States into federations of equal force was decided long before the Civil War by the high financial powers of Europe. These bankers were afraid that the U.S., if they remained as one block and as one nation, would attain economic and financial independence, which would upset their financial, uh, the Bank of England's financial domination over the world. That is the reason for the so-called civil war. Well, uh, well I'm going to tie that to. I, I got one yeah. question, real quick. Um, there's a lapse between that. You said like 1938 and the wars in 1961 or 1861 and 1838. Um, it's important to note of these events that were happening in Europe, which probably took a lot of focus and effort and, let's dare say, capital of the capitalists to manage what was going on over in Europe during that time. Because we're talking right at the end of the end of the French Revolution, which led in, basically led to the Prussian Revolution, where these Marxists all came from. And the bankers kind of had their hands full with what was going on in Europe at the time to put as much focus into the United States as they probably wanted to. True. Well, yeah. we get, we're just about out of time. Yeah. Mike, tell people how they can get more of your ramblings. <laughs> well, my ramblings will begin on the RBN, Republic Broadcasting Network, this Saturday at 4 p.m. Eastern. Uh, I'm really wondering how long I will last at that forum because uh, my job in life is to try to piss as many people off as I can with the truth. So I'm not exactly sure how long that will go, but I will have a program on Republic Broadcasting Network uh, Friday starting uh, Saturday starting at, uh, at 4 p.m. Eastern and uh, would invite folks to come listen. And then, again, I'm working on several projects, uh, you know, and uh, unfortunately, I've had to kind of uh, leave by the wayside uh, rep uh, the rebelmadman.org, but I'm going to get back on that as soon as I can, Jim. So, uh, and uh, my podcast, Whistling Dixie and what have you, those are out there as well. Thanks, yep. Jim, for bringing that up. No problem. I'll, I'll give you one Saturday. eight on my uh, CastBox channel, too. Um, what was that you were saying, Robert? He said he wants to know how long he'll last. I said, I'll give him one Saturday. He's going by Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Robert. Thanks, Robert. You That'll be a new record, I think. Piss people off. <laughs> well, you know, the truth does that, Robert. So I don't have much of a choice because I'm not going to lie to you. So you'll feel all fuzzy and happy. There you mm. go. And you won't root for Georgia, Georgia Bulldog football either. Uh, no, I don't care how many of my neighbors threaten to shoot me. <laughs> I'm surprised you're still living there, actually. Oh, I'm, I'm doing it because it pisses people off. Oh, that too. That too. <laughs> hey, Mike, I left a private uh, message for you. Yep. Oh, thanks, Brent. I appreciate it, brother. Thank no you kids. very much. It's been fun, but we're out of time. I want to thank Mike and Cal and DW and everybody that's been here today been a great show as usual and uh take you ask you have a wonderful weekend take care of your bodies because the only place you have to live will be back live on monday 
Take care, guys. Have a good one. See you. Adios, amigo.